yes. on behalf of the appellants, Mr Sheehan, for the respondent. Yes. Um, my Lord, in, in terms of housekeeping, can I hand up two documents, please? Uh, one is a set of three copies of the documents so kindly uh, sent by Lord Justice Snowden's clerk yesterday, which is... Oh, I think we've got those already. You, you've got those already? Yeah. Uh, okay, well, assuming we don't have any problems with pagination. The other thing that I've discussed with my learned friend is that it would be useful to have available the 2000 regulation. Right. Which is the original regulation, because lots of the cases, in fact, all of the cases that we're going to go to in detail were decided under, under that regulation. Yes. In terms of the um, Leon Mobile, uh, the court would have gathered that uh, the translation that we sent through, uh, and, and as everyone's French is good enough, I, m mine isn't, uh, the translation we sent through yesterday is an AI translation, and we've agreed, my friend and I, that if anything turns on it, um, we can go to the expense, but it is a considerable expense of uh, getting yeah. a, a certified translation. But let's, let's crack on and see... Um, see whether that's going to be necessary. So you ran it through Google Translate or one of those things? Well, I, I, I didn't, but I, I think, there's, I, I think there, I, I'm told there are systems that are far better than Google. I mean, I, I had to put about 30 words into Google Translate to understand it, and then 20 minutes later I got the uh, <laughs> official trans, the right. well, semi-official translations. I must say, I'm, I'm amazed if a machine was able to do that. It was pretty, looked pretty good to me. Yeah. We, uh, absolutely. Well, um, I, I'm not going to judge. I'm not sure my French is good enough to say whether. Anyway, well, anyway. Um, if, if we need a better, if, if we need an official agreed translation, we can work on that. But I'm, personally, I'm not sure that we will need to, yeah. to do that. Yeah. So um, well, I can tell you that we've obviously we've read yeah. Deputy Judge Baster's judgment. We've read the judge's judgment, and we've read the scanner. Uh, I'm grateful for that indication, Lord. So um, I, I, I'm going to get into the recitals. Uh, to the 2015 regulation in a second, because I think they're important. But if I just say this, uh, we acknowledge this is a second appeal with all the baggage that uh, is attendant uh, on that. <coughs> um, uh, well, I don't think there is much baggage, is there? There's only a baggage in getting permission. <laughs> well, once, once you've got permission, it proceeds it's, as, it's, as it's any other appeal. appeal. It's just an appeal. Um, and, and the question, essentially, is whether the judge was entitled to interfere with the judgment of Deputy Judge Baster. Uh, 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 absolutely. One thing we would pray in aid, though it doesn't do very far, is the fact that Lord Justice Arnold obviously uh, granted us permission for second appeal. I, I think the situation, from recollection, the situation at the hearing before uh, Mr Justice Miles was that he couldn't give permission because it was a second appeal. Correct. So it couldn't get any further. Correct. His, whether he would have done doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, but in granting uh, permission, you may have seen its core page, uh, page 59. Uh, Lord Justice Arnold noted that he considered that the appeal had a real prospect of success. I'm yeah. happy to look at that. Well, it's very short and it doesn't... He wouldn't have granted permission. Oh, right. Absolutely. <laughs> and he also... Um, he also... Um, Suggested that it uh, correctly we say that, it, that the appeal raises important points of principle concerning um, Kobe. So um, we say that he was correct. We do say that this is an, an odd but nonetheless important case for three reasons. Those reasons being first, that it brings into sharp focus the strength of the presumption in Article 3 1 of the recast regulations. Secondly, because it calls for focus on the objectively ascertainable evidence required to rebut it. And in short, whilst the authorities, and principally Stanford, that we'll look at, speak of third party creditors or typical third parties doing business with the company, is it open to the court to ignore the actual evidence of an actual third party who actually did business with the actual company? So the point is whether the typical third party is or should always be a hypothetical third party, even where the court is appraised of actual facts gained by an actual person in an actual transactions, transaction, series of transactions or other dealings. And Thirdly, the case is important in relation to letterbox companies, 
i.e. Um, companies that have no head office, possibly no office in either an administrative or operation, operational sense at all, but nonetheless are involved somehow in managing their interests, wherever those interests may be. So that, that we say, those we say are the three reasons why this appeal is important. That last one is actually possibly of particular importance nowadays, where nobody seems to do anything from any particular place. Nobody goes into offices any, uh, mm. anymore, not just because of the pandemic, just because of the way that uh, um, the world and the cyber world has, has, has developed. So that's all I really want to say by way of background. Um, we referred, obviously, in our written submissions to various provisions in the recast regulation. Uh, but I'd like to take a few minutes to take my lords um, through those <coughs> regulations just to emphasize a few points, not least because um, the, as I've said, the cases that have been referred to below, and many of the cases in, uh, in, in our bundle, were cases decided under a similarly named but we say materially different um, regulation. So um, if I can invite the court to take up the authorities from the last tab, tab 15. There we have the uh, regulation. I don't think it should be, I don't think it's controversial with my friend and I don't expect any pushback from my lord that it's perfectly appropriate to look at the recitals in, uh, in a European regulation. Of course. Um, I'm grateful for that. So if we could start at reci recital 23, please, which is on page 327. And I could invite the court to read that. So there we have the distinction between uh, main and secondary uh, proceedings. And we see that secondary proceedings can be opened in a state where the company has an establishment. From a Lord's note, establishment is a uh, defined term in the regulations, and that's page 331. It's Article 2.10, and I'll just read it out. Establishment means any place of operations where a debtor carries out or has carried out in the three-month period prior to the request for open main insolvency proceedings a non-transitory economic activity with human means and assets. So that's what establishment uh, means. And then if we could um, move to Recital 27, please and have a read of that. Yeah. So, um, before opening insolvency proceedings, and I'm not sure we need to trouble ourselves with the niceties of what opening means or whatever else, um, the court has to, of its own motion, examine whether the centre of the debtor's main interest or, the, or its establishment is actually located within its uh, jurisdiction. And I think the way it works now, I, I can't quote the court chapter and verse, but the way it works nowadays, and has, pro has worked since probably the 2000 um, regulation, is that in a, in a, a company case, in, in, in a petition, the, the petitioner will assert where the comey is, and the court will look at that. And if the court's if there's any controversy, usually there's no controversy, um, it's usually a domestic company, but if there's any controversy, then then, then the court will have to determine yeah. one way or another by calling for evidence or whatever else, and we'll look at some another provision that deals with that, <coughs> just so the court can be satisfied uh, that it is the court seized of uh, jurisdiction for whatever type of proceedings um, are in play. And then if we can have a look at recital 28, please, which I will read out. When determining whether the centre of the debtor's main interest is ascertainable by third parties, special consideration should be given to the creditors 
and to their perception as to where a debtor conducts the administration of its interests. This may require, in the event of a shift of centre of main interest, informing creditors of the new location from which the debtor is carrying out its activities in due course, for example, by drawing attention to the change of address in commercial correspondence or by making the new location public through uh, other appropriate means. Now, I don't suggest that those two methods are necessarily exhaustive. <coughs> it does, the uh, uh, recital does suggest that there, there is some sort of obligation to inform creditors of that new uh, location. I'm not sure I need to say too much more about the second sentence of that um, recital. It's the first sentence that we want to focus on. So uh, a number of points arise from that first sentence. In determining whether the Comey is ascertainable by third parties, special consideration, the legislator's words, not mine, should be given to the creditors and to their perception as to where a debtor conducts the administration of its assets. We say those words are um, important for a number of reasons. First, because it specifically enjoins someone, presumably the court, to give special consideration to the creditors and to their perception as to where the debtor conducts its uh, the, admi the administration of its interests. We suggest that can only mean the actual creditors. Otherwise, there will be no need for the definite article. And also, if it's not the actual creditors, then how does the court give the special consideration to the Perceptions. It can only be actual creditors of the actual company. I'm going to say actual a lot this morning, and I've already said it. <laughs> I've already actually already said it a lot. <laughs> but uh, uh, I hope you'll forgive me, and I know you understand why. But the background to this is that this is the recast regulation. These provisions uh, did not appear in the previous regulation. That's they the point. encapsulate the jurisprudence of the. European Court in Eurofoods and Interreddy or another case. Well, I, I, I'm not sure that this encap in, encapsulates the express language I of either of those cases. There are other insert. There are well, other. It, it in, it, sorry, it, it encapsulates the jurisprudence. Uh, I'm not saying it. I'm yes. not saying you can find precisely these words. Yes. But but this is a new recital. <coughs> and in fact, a new definition. Yeah. Um, of Comey. Um, in this recast regulation. Okay. Yeah. Certainly, the, 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 we'll look at it in a moment, but there's one passage which is more or less a direct, li direct lift from Interdeal. Yeah. I'm not sure that these words are... No, I think you're right. Ne ne ...necessarily so, <coughs> or could necessarily be gleaned from either Eurofood or Interdeal. <coughs> but whether that's right or not doesn't really matter because right. they're here on the page. But the Lord obviously is quite right that uh, when, it got, when it got to 2015 or whenever, uh, whoever it was was discussing what to do with the cast regulation, um, they decided to uh, update it to take account of the learning, possibly more than that. I, I, I'm not sufficiently au fait. But um, we do say that those words are obviously um, important. And uh, we can discuss what special consideration means and how the court gives special consideration to the creditor's perception and also what perception means. But even before getting into the nitty gritty of those questions, we suggest that it's crystal clear that any suggestion that under these regulations, forget the original one, under these regulations, that the court can simply ignore what an actual creditor learned doing actual, in, in the course of actual dealings <clears throat> with the company, must be wrong. To the contrary, special consideration must be given to what that actual creditor perceived. In the course of what? Trading activities or 
with the company or as a result of inquiries made um, before next, launching a petition or that's the next big question and I, 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 I am going to address it just sticking with the language of the uh, recital uh, its perception as to where a debtor conducts the administration of its interests now what's the administration of its interests I'll come on to that question I'm not going to uh, I'm obviously not going to duck it because it's very important but the interests of a company, I'll just leave this hanging, can, can change. A company may have very, very many interests when it's a successful trading company. I don't, I don't know, something like IKEA or whatever. Examples are always appalling. But it can have interests <coughs> all over the world. And it can have interests in all different countries, territories, whatever else. What you have to look at is what were the interests of the company at the time in question? Now, answering that question in relation to a multinational conglomerate uh, can obviously be, be pretty tricky, uh, and, and uh, there may be no obvious answer. But when all the courts got to go on, this is a point I'll develop, when all the co courts got to go on is the pretty thin rule that... Um, <coughs> reg sorry, uh, uh, Deputy, I've always, always called him registrar, the deputy, uh, um, the deputy judge had. You have to look at the state of the company as far as you can understand it at that time. What are the company's interests? And if the company's inter sole interests are an arbitration in London and proceedings in London pursuant to um, a transaction governed by English law, headed London, then those are the interests, then those are the interests of the company. But I'll come on to that more fully in due course, if I may. I must say that sounds a counterintuitive proposition. So if a company which has hitherto been trading in and run from Malta, from Malta. Malta yep. ceases to trade, yep. but there is an outstanding dispute with somebody which is litigated in London, that Transfers, well, Comey? That, 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 that might be right, because th these are necessarily fact-sensitive no. um, <coughs> issues. If you take out of the equation, first part of the law's proposition, the company that traded from Malta, because this company never traded from Malta. There's nothing to suggest this company. No, I understand. I understand. Yeah. Um, and all you've got is a few clues most of which point to somewhere other than Malta. I mean, you, you would say, would you, that if the, in the normal course of events of a, of a company, interests would include uh, assets, yeah. i.e. administration of its assets. <coughs> assets to include shows in action, which would include yes. litigation. Assets yes. in, could include staff. Yep. Personnel yep. that's drawn attention to in a number of cases yep. could include financing, yep. by borrowing money, paying debts, trading with people, issuing invoices, all the things that a company does. But is this right? You're saying that if a company ceases to trade, so let's assume for present purposes it liquidates its assets, pays off all its creditors, has a sum of money in a bank account, that's an asset, but has an outstanding piece of litigation which needs to be resolved before it could wind up its affairs. The question I think that's being put is, does, in those circumstances, the Comey tr transfer well, to the place in which it is conducting its only last activity, namely defending the litigation or prosecuting litigation, Prior to winding up, that's the, that's the no, I, fact I, pattern and the question. I think. So no, no, I, it has to be part of the interdeal comprehensive assessment. Yeah. If you've got nothing else, if the judge court has nothing else, because in all the cases that we've looked at, they've either presumed or, it's, Eurofood is, um, uh, I, 
I, I think proceeded on the basis of a uh, a referral. And the facts <coughs> were stated therein. The facts were pretty simple. You got an Irish company with real people, real yeah. bits on seats in Ireland um, that could be controlled by the Italian um, <coughs> ultimate parent. Um, those, the, 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 those cases are rather different. But what we haven't got in this case is any of the things that my lord put to me. But you will never have nothing else. You will Sorry? always have the registered office. Well, well the, 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 always. The, yes, you're, 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 you, you will always have a registered office. You will always have a registered office. We'll come to the strength of the presumption, whatever else. But what one normally finds in, a, in these cases is that the company or who, uh, who uh, comes forward with its version of events, its statement of facts, connecting factors in hmm. connecting factors, um, and says no for reasons one to ten because we've got a, a CFO and a CEO in wherever, and because we've got an office with seven people or had for fifty years, and now that we're in liquidation or now that we're on the uh, now that we're in straightened circumstances, we haven't got it. But that's where we always operated from, and everybody knew that. So that, that, that's a common or garden mm. case, and that's a normal. And, and those are the kind of cases we see in the in, in our authorities bundle. But we haven't got that here. All we've got here is a recently changed um, registered office. Registered office changed for reasons that the deputy judge really didn't find acceptable because they weren't properly explained and we'll look at that. Um, well he said the inference is it's trying to avoid yeah. proceedings. Yeah. 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 Because it they, well I, 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 I think the reason given was to save expense, but he said without more, uh, that argument's or that, that assertion is he was skeptical about pretty it. hopeless. Um, and therefore um, the obvious answer was that it was to avoid uh, enforcement. So that's all you want. On, so on, on the one hand here, you've got a registered office. Query how heavy, how, how weighty the presumption uh, is, and other bits and pieces with the company not being forthcoming. I'll take you to that. Not being forthcoming at all about what it even was, if or where it did anything, or what it did, or how it did it, and through what means. If you're uh, going to take us to the evidence, can you at some point um, identify for me where in the bundle, if at all, there is. Uh, any of the correspondence which I think was said to have taken place um, with the BVI post change of the registered office. Of all, yeah. the, of all the various exhibits we have, that correspondence seems to be omitted. I, 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 number I, 10 of, in the first. I think the exhibits have been filleted somehow, haven't they? Yeah, that they one seems to have been <coughs> filleted out. Well, it, I don't um, know whether anybody places any reliance on it, but it just isn't there. Um, well, I, I hear what you say, and we'll have a look at that perhaps over the short adjournment, um, but if not sooner, if it's, if, if it's available in court. But anyway, the, the, in, in, in answer to the, to the point, we haven't got any of the kind of stuff that um, my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Snowden put to us. And it was open to the company to say, no, no, we are obviously a Maltese company because we have a million people in an office in the letter and a building named <coughs> um, Mellors, whatever else. None of that was forthcoming. So anyway, um, back if I may to um, recital 28. Yeah. Um, I've made the point that it's obvious that on the express language of the recital, special consideration has to be given to the creditors um, <coughs> Perception. Now, none of the cases in our bundle deal with those words. Not surprising, because Eurofood, Stanford, and um, Lennox, for what it's worth, if I can put it that way, uh, were all decided under the 2000 um, regulation. And query of what relevance um, they would have been on the actual facts of those cases cases in any um, event. So insofar as it may be suggested, 
And there are passages in uh, Mr. Justice Marl's judgment which do seem to us actually to go this far. And we'll look at them. The Comey must, the Comey test is decided by reference to what a hypothetical, typical, whatever that means, um, third party creditor might learn had it done any business with the debtor. Is, we suggest, wrong. And it's wrong even if the learning and the legislation stopped after Eurofood, Interdeal, or Stanford. <coughs> uh, well, there are two, there are at least two possibilities, aren't there? The first is that um, you have to postulate a hypothetical creditor, yeah. which may have difficulty where, in fact, as is often the case, there are different <coughs> groups or classes yeah. of creditors. Um, in other words, you may struggle in the same way as you do with company law to postulate an average person yeah. if that's what you mean. Yeah. That's in a difficult case. You don't have that problem. No, no. Problem but this yeah. regulation applies to difficult cases. Yeah. Um, but there's also the possibility that what you that you have to do something like that. In other words, you have to look at what's publicly available to groups of creditors. Yeah. On the one hand, on the other hand, there's the question which I think this case raises, which is, do you actually have regard to an individual creditor oh. who, in the course of something other than perhaps what might be regarded ordinary trade, makes, or, 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 no, makes well, investigations? I mean, well, the, the, my, my Lord, no. Um, it is not suggested, for instance, the deputy judge relied on the charter part. That was the opening gambit in the um, dealings between the parties. No suggestion that that wasn't other than in the ordinary course of trade. Right. We don't know what the other. We don't. We, we don't know what the company's ordinary trade was because it didn't condescend to tell us that this was just a sideline. And in fact, it sold computer keyboards out of Buenos Aires or something. But th that was actual trade with the company. And in the first situation that the, uh, the law mentioned. Um, where there are different groups of creditors with different interests. Nonetheless, we fail to see how, having regard to Article 28, the court could say, which it wouldn't do, but the court could say, well, it's all too <coughs> difficult because there are six different classes, classes of creditors with different interests or whatever else. I, I, and I'm I, going to look at I don't think that was the point no. I was making actually, the, and I've probably made it very badly. No, I probably misunderstood it. The, your criticism of uh, Mr. Justice Miles's um, judgment related to the idea that one had to look for a quote hypothetical yeah. creditor. Yeah. And in a sense, I, I can understand that criticism if by that you mean what Mr. Justice Miles meant, you have to hypothesize some average. Yeah. Creditor, single hypothetical person. Yeah. Um, so that to give an illustration, suppose there are a group of finance creditors who have regular dealings with the company because they extend credit to the company. Yeah. What they understand about the company and their dealings with the company in the course of arranging finance and conducting financial yeah. affairs might be very different from the perception of a trade creditor yeah. who <coughs> sells raw materials to the company for use in its manufacturing process, let's Probably. say. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm taking it away from the fact of this particular Yeah, yeah case, absolutely. Right? Yeah. So I understand your criticism of the concept of a hypothetical creditor, if that's taken too literally, yeah. because it may not be any one creditor or anything else. But yeah. the difference, I think, that's potentially being highlighted or put to you earlier, which you need to come on to deal with, is the situation where a, a creditor or creditors in the public could find information in the public domain or mm -hmm. through their regular dealings on the one hand yeah. and a creditor who wouldn't know of those matters in the ordinary course of dealing to 
to either relationships with the company or what's in the public domain, yeah. but conduct some private investigation in order to sustain a piece of litigation or insolvency yeah. litigation by conducting investigations or inquiries yeah. as to what actually is going on behind the facade yeah. of the company. Well, and and I, I think the suggestion is that that latter type of evidence is out with is out with what the in, what the regulation envisages. My lord, I I, 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 I I can see that getting Kroll or whoever are you know, private investigators to interrogate matters that aren't in the public public to me and come up with uh, 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 and come up with a Comey theory based on uh, that that wouldn't be available to typical a, a typical creditor or actual creditors mm. dealing with a company who didn't undertake those inquiries <coughs> might be out with the um, ambit of considerations under Article 28 or any of the uh, or, or Euro Foods or Stanford or whatever else. On the facts of this case, there is only one bit of information that was elicited through any form of inquiry, and that related to the Revolut bank account, which had been which was opened, I think, a couple of years after the litigation. So, on the facts of this case, that would only knock out one of the deputy judges' consideration. So I think I'm a, 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 a one with my lord on inquiries. If you get a gumshoe, in, if a creditor gets a gumshoe in and discovers things that nobody else would have known, simply either from public statements or the public domain, or doing typical whatever that is um, business with the company, um, that latter class of information, um, the court would not be enjoined under any of the tests, be it. Recital 28 test, or as interpreted by the courts, to have regard to that. <coughs> and that's pretty, I mean, that, that, and, and that really is the point, I, as, I suppose, in, in its broadest sense, that was raised in, um, in Sanford. Because um, had, had the creditors. Got private detectives involved, or um, got a mole into the uh, ranch in Texas, so that they could have discovered that in fact Stanford was operating um, a Ponzi scheme. Um, that's what the court said should not be uh, was was not a legitimate thing to have. Well, I, actually, the submission that was made, which I rejected, and the court of appeal upheld me, was that the information would consist of any information. That would be obtained by by the company giving honest answers yeah. to inquiries. Yeah, well, my, my lord's right. So it's not, so it wasn't a question of you know ferreting out. No, but that, 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 that's that, that me was, going one stage further. Yeah, but he, 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 even he, he, even at that stage, um, I, I I can see that that is um, difficult both in terms of the authorities and even in terms of uh, Article Twenty Eight. But on the facts of our case, there's only one bit of information which is of mm -hmm. marginal um, weight or value in any event, because it postdated the opening of the um, proceedings, which is the Revolut bank account. But everything else was learned just by doing business with the company and or in the course of enforcing rights um, against the company, which is something that creditors will typically, creditors will typically do. So, um, well, bef before moving away from uh, Article 28, and the court can see that I'm placing quite a bit of weight on Article 28, including it. So, um, it's a recital, not an article. Oh, sorry, it's, uh, I I I'm grateful, my lord. Um, recital 28. Special consideration can't simply mean, we suggest, read, look at, or take into account anything that that um, creditor, creditor says. 
we suggest that that would be a very strange reading of those specific words. Um, and that different language would be used. If it was being, if, if the legislator, legislator simply meant read their, read their evidence, it's far easier to, to say something to, 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 to that effect. Um, so uh, what does it mean? Uh, we suggest that taking recital 28 as a whole, and indeed all the other relevant recitals, which uh, include recitals 27 and 32, it can only mean that it should have particular regard to, and as part of its determination, attribute, attribute particular or special weight to the perceptions, quote unquote, of actual creditors. I've never really understood what the best evidence rule is, but the best evidence of what a company does must surely be what people dealing with the company understand it to do as a result of those dealings. And um, we say that not only because of the words special consideration to creditors, <clears throat> but also because of the word perception, perception of the um, creditors. That, that's obviously, we say, an important word. And that it doesn't mean simply what they saw or heard. Well, I mean, you, you can, sorry, I'm just to move it along a bit, but I mean, you also say, I think, that in the second sentence, one of the examples that's given of a Comey shift yeah. requires informing, or suggests, doesn't yes. require, suggests informing creditors of the new location. Well, yeah. by definition, those must be actual creditors yeah. rather than just <coughs> the world at large. The world at large. Yeah. Um, because that's dealt with at the end of that sentence where it talks about making the new location public through other appropriate means. Yeah. And presumably you also say in 32, which you drew, just drew attention to, that if there's doubt about it, the court can invite um, the company to put in evidence so as to give the debtors creditors the opportunity to present their views on the question of jurisdiction yeah. so that they have some role to play yeah. by actual <coughs> creditors. Yeah. The court's not disinterested. Yeah. So, but perception can't just mean what they saw or heard. It has to mean the... Um, the way in which actual creditors regarded, understood, or interpreted the comi of the uh, debtor. And that's, there's no straining of language in mm. arriving at that proposition. So that's what we say about uh, article, sorry, recital 28. And that fits in neatly with one of the incentives um, of, or, or, or rather with the policy principle of the um, regulations to avoid incentives for forum shopping. And for that, we refer to recitals five and 29. My Lord, recital 30, If I could invite the court to have a read of that, please.
Um, presumption, which we'll come to, is rebuttable, and the court should carefully consider whether it is genuinely in the state of the registered uh, office. That's the first half or so of uh, that recital. Could you help me with this on recital 30? Um, am I right in thinking that the first sentence is dealing with companies and the second sentence, sorry, the second and third sentences are dealing with individuals and not with companies? Yes, they're, 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 it, it, <coughs> first, it, it, and, first and second are dealing with companies. Yeah. Yeah. And sorry, yes. first and yeah. second. Yeah. And then the third and fourth deal with individuals. Individuals. Yeah. It's just that it's curious that the presumption in the case of individual can be rebutted where it can be established that the principal reason for moving was to file for insolvency proceedings in the new jurisdiction, whereas that doesn't seem to apply to the company. Well, that, that, that doesn't... Um, hasn't been expressly stated. I think when we look at Leon Mobile, we can discuss um, uh, what the consequences are for a company of a um, fictitious move. But certainly the policy mm. of the um, regulations, and let's just see if I can pull it marked up. Yeah, um, if, if we can go back to 325, I'm not sure I need to emphasize this, but the policy of the regulation generally in this regard, it is set out in recital five. It's necessary for proper function of the internal market to avoid incentives to parties to transfer assets or judicial proceedings from one member state. And then, article, uh, sorry, recital twenty nine, back on three to eight. I don't think I skipped over. Um, the regulations should contain a number of safeguards aimed at preventing fraudulent or abusive forum yeah. shopping. <clears throat> and so whilst, it, whilst my Lord's quite right that there are those express words in relation to individual bankruptcy cases. I mean, it reflects <coughs> the, the, the third sentence of 30 about individuals reflects the concern that had arisen under the first regulation that there was bankruptcy tourism. tourism everyone. Um, I mean, there was a very well-known flat in Leeds that was the residence of a whole host of German bankrupts, yeah. um, German citizens who wanted to get an automatic discharge from bankruptcy after one year here, which they couldn't get if they'd have remained yeah. resident or domiciled in, habitually resident in Germany. Yeah. And that was a well-known yeah. problem. And that, there were a clutch of cases, I think, around the, uh, uh, I I involving bankruptcy tourism. Yeah. Um, it may be just a specific um, reflection of that. But I think the point that's been made is that um, it doesn't appear, at least in the words, um, that you can adopt the same approach to the presumption in a corporate sense that you can with a, an individual. Well, there's, I think there's a different presumption in, 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 in relation to... Um, bankruptcies. But the general takeaway point, I think, is that the burden of the regulations, as stated in uh, Recital 29, is to prevent <coughs> fraudulent, fictitious or whatever, or abusive forum shopping. Of course, the cases say that it's perfectly open for a company to um, move its registered office or whatever else. The court should look carefully uh, at that um, at that type of conduct. Yeah. The language about comprehensive assessment, I think that, my lord, uh, is the lift, not necessarily ver verbatim from interdil. That's the first time I think we see these words in um, the regulations. One small point we should make about recital 30. Is that it comes after article 
Oh, sorry, re recital 28. And so when it speaks about <coughs> a comprehensive assessment and so on, it's not talking about some sort of different comprehensive assessment or a comprehensive assessment based on some different hypothetical creditor. It must, we say, be talking about a comprehensive assessment based on material, including the recital 28 material, which, are, which is the actual knowledge of creditors actually dealing with the um, company. Yeah. <coughs> and then um, recital 31. If I can invite the court to read that, please. This is a bright line rule, yep. 31. So that's where we get the <coughs> presumption from, and it's a different presumption from the presumption that was in the 2000 regulations. 2000 regulations didn't have a... Well, it just didn't exist. This was new in 2015. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Presumption's the same. The presumption's the same. But yeah. this, this bright line was introduced in 2015. Well, the, the, the three-month... Yeah. Yeah. If I can now di digress for a moment to tell you, to tell the court rather, of something of the background, you, the court may have seen our chronology at Core Tab 3. I'm not sure I need to take you to it. The evidence explains what happened. For your note, it's Parish first witness statement, it's Supplemental Bundle 12. I'm happy to look at it. Supplemental Bundle Tab 12. And it's paragraph eight. Okay, page. Oh, sorry, page eighty-seven, my lord. Should be anyway. <coughs> and it's paragraphs eight to eleven. We start the proceedings. Oh, we start an arbitration in London to, to the charter party. The company says, "Hold on, um, this is out with the charter party." So, unsurprisingly, we then go off to the BVI, start proceedings. In the meantime, I think the company changes its registered office. <coughs> then, in the BVI, we um, obtain a default judgment company applies to set aside the default judgment yeah. on the basis that the, <laughs> uh, this is all arbitrable, so never have, um, and um, one way or another the court sets aside the default judgment. Um, the company then doesn't put in a defence, we get a um, default judgment, a judgment in default of defence. The short point is, I'm not sure where it goes, perhaps doesn't go very far, save to perhaps explain the 
true reasons for the change of the mm. uh, registered office. Um, the short point is that had we proceeded with the, ha had there been no bizarre application to set aside the original judgment, then everything could have been done and dusted within the three month period. Yeah. Okay, that, that would have then been a BVI um, um, winding up. So just, just so I've just got the legal framework right. The, the company's registered office is in Malta. You say it's Comey is in the UK. Yeah. And that, you say, look at the cipher 28, depends on the perception of the creditors, including actual creditors, yeah. including your clients, who are doing business with the company. Who? Are doing business yeah. with the company. And I think you accepted in reply to my Lord Lord Justice Snowden, that doesn't include what you call gumshoe inquiries. So looking at what Mr. Parrish says, you are... You enter into a charter party with a BVI company. The charter party goes all wrong. Enter, well, if I can uh, be very rude and interrupt, we enter into an English law yeah, yeah, charter English. party headed London. Right, all right, yeah. But with a BVI company, it all goes wrong. You sue in the BVI. No, you, we, we, we arbitrate in London. And the company says, "Well, according to paragraph nine, you started, you sued in the BVR." No, paragraph eight, my lord. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. I did. I so did. they they deny jurisdiction, right? Yeah. Um, so you sue in the BVI. Yeah. You get a judgment in the BVI, and various procedural things happen in the BVI. Yeah. <coughs> then the company moves its registered office to Malta without telling you. And according to paragraph 13, it kept pretending to be a BVI company in correspondence from its BVI address. So if one's looking at the perception of your clients in the course of its dealings with this company, well, why is the perception not that it is a BVI company as well, opposed to having its Comey in the UK? Well, it, 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 in the same way that when I enter into a contract in the ordinary course of business, I may not give much thought to those matters. I go into a sweet shop to buy sweets. I don't know whether I'm dealing with a, uh, a sole trader company or, 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 or a company or a partnership or anything else. But I think the point, so, the point that's being put to you is that all sorts of people around the world choose English law to govern their shipping operations. Yeah. They enter into charter parties governed by English law when neither of them have anything to do, either party to the charter body has anything to do with London at all. Yeah. And the fact of entering into an English law governed, English law arbitra arbitrable charter party says nothing about Comey, otherwise all sorts of companies would inadvertently find that their Comey had suddenly shifted to London. Well, the Lord... And, and so, um, and, and the paragraph 13 was what I was referring to earlier when I said I thought was, I asked whether that correspondence was in the bundle which I don't think it is. No. Um, but if it was, on the face of its description, um, it would suggest that something is happening in the BVI. I, that's where the company is corresponding with a creditor from, not London. Well, my Lord, or, or at it, least it, that is your perception. Well, my Lord, in, 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 in my experience, nothing actually happens in, in the BVI other than... Well, you know, that, that may be, but yeah. you, you, you very much stress the word perception yeah. in Recital 28. That is well, what the creditor understands, was the way you glossed yes. that, not necessarily the reality. But, and that was, in a sense, the point in Stanford. The reality was quite different from what, but, people, un what people understood. My Lord, the question of perception has to be determined at the relevant time, at the relevant time. Uh, and that perception does not have to be, uh, and that perception, people don't, in my submission, pay a great deal of regard to questions of Comey when they're all, in, when, when they're entering into business. I disagree fundamentally. Sorry? I disagree fundamentally. It's a fundamental part of assessing the insolvency risk, uh, the, uh, the risk of default of a counterparty, 
um, where you may be able to institute insolvency proceedings and the regime that they'll be conducted under. That's the whole ethos of the insolvency regulation. You should know and be able to predict what insolvency regime will apply to your counterparty if they go bust. Well, the Lord, that is not the way the regulation is framed, because the COMI has to be determined at a later date than the transaction. True, but if that is absolutely true, but the questions of commercial certainty <coughs> and the like are all, um, they don't know, it's sent to two, two stages. One, when you're a creditor, when you are extending no. credit to the company, you need to have some understanding of where insolvency may eventuate if your counterparty goes bust. No. And as the recital you showed us indicates, if you're going, if that counterparty is going to move its comey, having dealt with creditors, having incurred credit, it behoves it to tell creditors or no. inform them because it changes materially potentially their insolvency risk. Well, my, my lord, I, I, I hear what you say, but <laughs> I don't necessarily. I, I'm not disagreeing. You have to assess it. Uh, and the regulation requires it to be assessed. It's chosen because it has to, a single point in time, yeah. namely when the insolvency proceedings are open. But to say it, it, it doesn't matter at any other earlier time. Well, um, to the extent that my lord's right, and I'm not suggesting you're, uh, my lord's entirely, entirely wrong, but uh, I, 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 I think issues such as that will depend on a, the nature, the size of the transaction uh, and, uh, and matters such as that whether I'm concerned about the insolvency risk of a counterparty for a $600,000 <coughs> or, or for a, a, a charter party of X hundred thousand dollars Re really depends on who I am, who they are, hmm. and the size of the transaction by reference to my ordinary course of dealing. If I'm putting all my eggs in that one tanker in Tajikistan, um, then I might be very worried about it. But the inescapable reality is that even if even if um, my clients had entered into the consideration that the Lord puts to me and thought it was a BVI they may simply have been wrong because there's nothing else to link things to the BVI. And what's more, the company doesn't assert and has never asserted that its going is actually in the BVI or, or was after whenever it was that it shifted its <coughs> registered office. So consideration can be given to those matters contemporaneously when, you, when, when, when one signs the charge party. You can simply be wrong then, and the time for the <coughs> considered reflection and the other ascertainable matters following the comprehensive assessment mandated by, I think it's recital 31, but you know what I'm talking about, is in fact a later date. But it, it had a registered office in the BVI. It did. That's a real fact. Yeah. Um, it corresponded as if from the BVI. It did, yeah. That's a real fact. Even after it shifted to Morgan. Even after it yeah. shifted. So it was pretending to be a BVI company when it wasn't. So if you then disregard the shift of registered office to Malta, which is what the Deputy Judge did, why doesn't the Comey revert to the BVI, which is where it was before? Why does it suddenly transfer to London, to the UK? Because the I know he rejected that because he said nobody was arguing for it. But yeah. as again you've stressed, this, the court has a duty of its own motion to examine yeah. this. So why, why was he right simply to eliminate the BVI? Because the Comey has to be tested at that later date. These transactions were in 2000 and whenever. Right. And we then had the deputy judge sitting in London in the summer of 2016. Yeah, and it's at that point in time that the Comey has to be tested. 
But, sorry, I, you said there's a chronology, and I'm just searching for it. So, yeah. Um, I think well, it's the order in, of the BBI court on, in June 2016, and the following month, you present your petition. According to the chronology. Sorry. Well, it, it, it's, it's tab three, below. Oh, sorry, tab three of the court. Oh, sorry. sorry. So when we look at paragraph 11, I'm oh, sorry, I just put it away. I'm just sorry, I'm just looking at paragraph 11 of the <coughs> statement, page 87. The order of the BDI court is 13th of June 2016. Yeah. That's the order assessing damages. There was an er there was an earlier order. Yeah, but that, that's, the one, that's the one referred to in the middle of paragraph 11. Yeah. So 13th 2016. Then there's a demand letter. To the company. What did that demand letter say? Um, well, I can't pretend to give actual uh, evidence of that, but I should imagine these pay us X hundred thousand dollars. Or, mm -hmm. or, or what? Um, I mean, you've got a judgment. It's a bit odd to send a demand letter to the judgment after ju after you've got a judgment. Pay the judgment. Did it threaten winding up proceedings? Well, Lord, uh, uh, I don't want to answer that. I'd be surprised if it didn't, but let me come back. If it did threaten winding up proceedings, what presumably it threatened to bring the winding up proceedings in the BBI. Well, Lord, uh, can, can we get hold of that letter just out of it? Well, we can try. We are making inquiries um, as I speak. But, my Lord, I... So just, let, to, let, just, just, to, sorry, just to go back to the chronology and tie it in with what Mr. Parrish says. Yeah. You begin your proceedings in the BBI in October 2015. You've got the default, first default judgment in November 2015. Yeah. Um, that is the paragraph 9 judgment. That's what Mr. Parrish is referring to in paragraph 9. Then the company moves to its um, registered office to Malta in December 2015. Um, after it's moved to Malta, it challenges the jurisdiction of the BBI courts. Presumably that's on the basis of the arbitration clause, see paragraph 10. Yeah. So it's still conducting litigation in the BBI, even though its registered office is in Malta. Um, then you get another judgment in default of defence. Well, if I could just say this, before we carry on with the uh, run through the chronology, these were just excuses. Well, I'm, they weren't I'm, realities. Well, maybe they, they were well, just trying to get a picture of the, the facts as they were. Yeah. So then you then you get you get your judgment in default in June twenty sixteen. Um, then you get a freezing order, and all that happens after the move to Malta. So when Mr. Parrish says at 12, the company has now moved its seat to Malta, that actually took place sometime between um, paragraph 9 and paragraph 10 <coughs> in his statement. Yeah. And even so, it's pretending to be a BBI company. Well, it, pretended, it, it, it pretended once. I think there's one letter. Well, what... Mm -hmm. Mr. Parrish says, is it kept pretending to be a BBI company? Yeah. It kept the... Well, we, 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 we'll, we'll dig out MTP yeah. one, one time. But all those things... That seems to be a picture of the facts. But, 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 but all those things, 
that all the things that the company did were in the course of trying to put itself into a better position. It never actually put its money where its mouth was. It took um, an absurd position, prima facie absurd, saying the arbitration, the, 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 uh, the uh, arbitrable issue was out with the arbitration clause, go to the BVI, mm. BVI, mm. go to the BVI. <laughs> no, actually, sorry, <laughs> go back to go back to London. <clears throat> and then um, when it really had to put its money where its mouth was and put in a defence, it didn't put in a defence and allow judgment. But I think the point that's been put to you is not that the company isn't wicked and terrible and hasn't done great things. I think the point that's actually being put to you is, except all that, yeah. why isn't the Comey in Malta? Why isn't the Sorry, it wasn't the Comey in the BVI. Why isn't the Comey in the, B in, in the BVI? Um, the Comey is not in the BVI because the company doesn't assert it's in the BVI. You can't rely on any sort of presumption for the for, for the BVI. So if one has to go to the regulations to determine where the but if the company is in the BVI, you're outside this regulation completely. Yes. Yeah. So the court has to understand where is the Comey. The court has to understand where the Comey is, and and for that, the court has to look at all the available material. And the available material in the face of a company that told the court that it was going to do these sorts of things and tell, us, tell the court where its Comey was, um, the available material is the material that was before uh, the judge. But this kind of ephemeral <coughs> stuff, the fact that there, were, there, 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 there was litigation in um, the BVI. But you rely on litigation as being one of the, you know, the big factors. Yes, but when one consider, but, but, but when one um, considers what the actual litigation was, when my client sat down and actually thought about what is this company actually doing, the conclusion that it reached, the materials that were available to it, showed that it was in London. And one thing this history does bring out, doesn't it, is the importance of the registered office. I mean, that's why you went to the BVI to start your proceedings there in the first place. It's the company of the registered office. Well, my lord, the place it's of the registered the office is... The jurisdiction of the registered sorry? office. Sorry? Yes, sorry, the jurisdiction. The, 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 the jurisdiction of the registered office is, is important, if it's real. But I mean, the reality of a registered office is determined just by looking at the relevant entries in the public... Records. Isn't well, it? In, in most places, I, I and the BVI companies places. are mostly, well, very often I suspect, um, don't have any great substantial presence in the BVI itself. Uh, many of them will be letterbox companies. Yes, but the the important, uh, I, I don't pretend that in an ordinary case, but ordinary cases you don't have Comey bust ups, you don't have arguments about um, Comey and where a conduct company well, that may be conducts so, its interest. Even so, this is of some relevance to the. Um, significance of the presumption and the weight of the evidence needed to yes. rebut it. I mean, in the case of a company, it's one of the few tangible facts you have. It, something it, you can verify on a register. You know exactly where you have to go if you want to sue the company. Um, and that's indeed what your clients did. I, I, I don't suggest that the place of incorporation, the place of the registered office, is not usually probably beginning, middle, and end of the consideration, and is not usually an important determinator of where a company conducts its business. Most companies in the UK, I would imagine, I, would give evidence, I imagine are doing business in the UK. I don't, I, I, I don't suggest that's wrong in any way, but that's an easy case. Those are easy cases. This is, and I said when I opened, this is an odd case. This is a case where a company doesn't actually want to be incorporated anywhere in particular. Where its registered office 
doesn't matter a great deal to it, save that it can point to it and say, oh, well, look at the presumption. Um, we'll stick with that. Lord, um, so those are the um, facts of the case. But the important takeaway point is that one, is, one isn't considering Comey as one goes along. Lord, Lord Darcy Snowden is probably right that in a, an important transaction, <coughs> the parties will have regard to each other's um, credit risk. Don't know whether this was an important uh, transaction for anyone in, in particular. Um, but the test isn't what they all thought. I mean, that, that, that's something that which may go into the mix what they all thought at the date of signing the charter party or the contract or whatever else. The test is falls to be determined on the opening of the um, proceedings. So, um, my lords, we were looking back at tab 15, the um, authorities you, you will have seen, and for your note, it's Core Tab 10, page 120, paragraph 22, that the deputy judge had no truck with the company's reasons for moving its yeah. registered office. So, can you just give me the reference again? Well, yes, it's Power 22 of um, Deputy Judge Basis Judgment, Tab Core 10. Page 120, <coughs> paragraph 22, where essentially he noted, found, that it moved its registered office because it wanted to put off, avoid, or avoid being wound up. <coughs> and he drew those conclusions, which we say were safe and available conclusions. A, because of the timing. Hence, I was interested in whether your letter threatened it, yeah. which you could only do if it was yeah. a BVI company, yeah. which well, is what you thought at the time. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Curry says that he has now seen the letter and it doesn't threaten winding up. And we can produce the letter yeah. over the course of the uh, after the short adjournment. Yeah. So uh, m maybe it is worth having a look back at the core bundle and see, seeing what the judge, sorry, the deputy judge <coughs> had to say a paragraph. Let me just get my note. Uh, but but you but you say that what um, the deputy judge said in paragraph twenty two is correct. You, that the company changed its registered office because it wished to avoid being wound up yes. in the BVI. Yeah. Right. So, so whether you threatened it or you didn't, that's yeah. what you say happened. Well, you wish, wish to avoid being wound up. Yeah. In the BVI. Well, presumably, it wished to avoid being wound up generally. Moved its registered office in the BVI, it was presumably to avoid being wound up in the BVI. Yes, but it didn't. If it wanted to be wound up somewhere else, then going back to the regulation where we saw that you know, companies should tell creditors uh, where they've gone, they might have written to us saying, um, Don't wind us up in the BVI, but please come and wind us up in Malta or somewhere else. It didn't do it, obviously. I'm not sure I'm following. Maybe, maybe no, no, no. I think the point is that before the registered office was moved, yeah. the company was vulnerable to being wound up in the BVI and the BVI alone. Yeah. So if it moved its registered office from the BVI to Malta in order to avoid being wound up or to delay being wound up, it did so in order to delay being wound up in the BVI. Yes. 
That's the point that's being yeah. put to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but more directly than I always <laughs> put it, so sorry. <laughs> That, 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 that's not to say when one has to address issues of COVID, where on considered reflection of following the dealings or, or, or the dealings that the company had had, that the BVI would necessarily have been the right place. I imagine even then, but it's really rather difficult for it to say you can't wind us up here because our COVID is not here because we're company registered. But when that was no longer available, that's really when the consideration had to um, uh, be made and reflected upon until um, the actual proceedings were brought and the issue and the, and the issue was live. Um, if we could look at core tab ten, page one hundred and twenty. <coughs> Paragraphs twenty four and twenty five of the Deputy Judges Judgment. This is something I'm sure my lords have seen, <coughs> where um, the deputy judge confesses that it's a difficult assessment, uh, but, but it's an assessment he nonetheless undertook, saying the evidence on both sides is unsatisfactory, it's long and sparse, and much of it has been given by citizens rather than by anyone with direct knowledge of important facts. Well, all that applies, I, I think, particularly to the company's evidence. The company's evidence was given by a solicitor on the advice of a foreign, the company's foreign lawyer, taking instructions from someone who we don't understand to be a director of the company. So it's a kind of third of, or fourth hand uh, hearsay. Contrast that with the case where normally one would expect a company to say by its director. Mm. or giving direct instructions to its solicitor uh, to say, no, this is what we do in um, Covent Garden, where our head office is, and uh, this is why we are uh, coming. This, is, this isn't that case. Um, and then paragraph 25, and this is an important um, passage in the judgment. The evidence is unsatisfactory because what it, what it admits to say, and then we've got the Sherlock Holmes stuff about the, um, the dog... Uh, barking. Mr. Um, Crittenden of the company had, I say promised, but threatened to um, explain what the to reveal all about the company's code. For that, if we can look at the supplementary bundle. Tab one, paragraph. Uh, sorry, tab one, page seven. Yeah. This came some. The, the court. The court will be aware that there was a moratorium. I think of all progress in proceedings uh, after the, after the petition was issued. So this affidavit, this witnessing, rather is about a year down the line. But at paragraph 11 there, Mr. Crittenden explains that now, i.e. June 2017, they were proactively gathering uh, evidence both in relation to its Comey and the proceedings in the uh, BVI. Mm -hmm. But that course of proactive um, gathering didn't result in much, and you'll have seen in Paris 24, 25 of the um, Deputy Judge's judgment uh, what he thought of it. Yeah. So, well, the, 
Well, Lords, that's something of a um, digression. If we could go back to the authorities' bundle. And the, recite, and the uh, just finish off with the um, regulations at tab 15. Page three to eight. I think we'd looked at <coughs> recital thirty two. Yeah. Of course, on the facts of this case, Deputy Judge Baster didn't have to tell the company um, to go away and come back and tell me all about yourself and what you do and where you do it. Um, the company volunteered to do that in Crittenden uh, 1. So that's paragraph 32. Uh, sorry, recital 32. And then I think, uh, for my purposes, the last relevant recital is 33. If the court's not satisfied that the Comey is, in our case, in England and Wales, or the UK probably, um, then it should not open proceedings. And then um, <coughs> if we can move forward to page 331 please. And just read the first two paragraphs of article 3. And um, we say it's obvious that when the, re the um, article speaks about ascertainable ascertainability by third parties, it is incorporating essentially by reference everything we've seen in the recitals. And then we've got the presumption in the second um, provision of Article 3 1. So, my Lord, um, that's the regulation. Turning to the meat of our submissions, we say that the Mr. Justice Miles, principal error was that he discounted the evidence of us, an actual third party, i.e. our client, dealing with the respondent. And what he had learned and perceived as a result of its dealings with the respondent. And as a result, we suggest... Well, is that right? What it had learned as a result of inquiries it made in order to be able to present the petition? No, my lord... But this... You didn't... Did you rely on... You, you relied on the Charter Party, and that's certainly true. Yes. Um, but And its enforcement. Yes. But your inquiries went a long way further than that. Well, we can look at what they are. The, right. the, the only inquiry that we made, that we relied on, was the Revolut account. This is not a case. This isn't a case as posited in, uh, was it Stanford, I think, where my clients wrote to them saying, tell us the truth about what goes on and who does what where. This isn't that case. This isn't a case where we scratched below, it's not a gumshoe case, it's not a private detective case, save possibly in relation to, um, uh, let's say, the Revolut account. This is a case where my clients in their evidence, or in the evidence on its behalf, 
set out the um, facts and matters which they said led them to believe that the company was administering its ass its interests in England and Wales. And the fact is that. But there's nothing, th 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 this, it's not an inquiry's case. So, uh, Mr. Justice Miles' principal error was to discount that evidence for what it's worth. I mean, I, 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 I said earlier, it's thin gruel. It is thin stuff. I accept that. But that's what we presented to the judge. As against that, we saw in Crittenden 1, whichever paragraph it is, um, the company saying, we are in the course of... <coughs> preparing or whatever, I can't remember the exact words. And that promise was uh, not fulfilled, such that the judge was left with a, uh, with a situation whereby the company who said we're going to do this, presumably to show that its Comey was wherever, um, was left not knowing what even what the company did. Whether this charter party was just a sideline of a company that sold used cars in Rotterdam. Um, <coughs> So it was a difficult case, but there was material before the court. And it may be, it may be, that any one of my lords, well, we know what Mr. Justice Miles uh, would have made of it. It may be that any one of my lords would have made the same as Mr. Justice Miles. Or it may be that, that what we suggest is, and this is kind of the, the uh, approach to the appellate jurisdiction, um, we suggest that that was a material before the court. It was open to the judge to make those findings. You may not like them. You may not. You may think well, the, I mean, the first question, I think, is: Was Mr. Justice Miles entitled to interfere with the decision of Deputy Judge Baster? If he wasn't, because Deputy Judge Baster made no error, then your appeal succeeds. That's the end of that. If he was entitled to interfere with the decision of Deputy Judge Baster and make therefore make his own decision, it's at that point that you begin to say yep. he was wrong for reasons whatever yep. it is. Yep. But until we've got past the question, was Mr Justice Miles entitled to interfere with the decision of the Deputy Judge, we don't get to any yes. of that. Yeah. Um. If I can stick with the way I was planning on presenting, but, but the, these are all issues that will be addressed. We, but we, we suggest that the error that Mr. Justice Miles made was in relation to the publicly available, public, publicly available, publicly public availability approach to the evidence that um, the deputy judge had said was ascertainable. So, my lord, if I, my lord, if I can focus on ascertainability, the meaning of that is apparent from the regulation, or rather, the learning for, uh, <coughs> that is apparent from the regulation that we've just looked at, uh, Eurofood and Stanford, and into, and we'll we'll look at those very briefly. But if I can just emphasize again that that was by reference to the 2000 regulation and not yep. to our regulation. So Eurofood is at tab three of the authorities. Now the Page um, fifty nine of the of tab three. Now, in your your whilst obviously it is a Comey case, there wasn't a great tussle about <coughs> what goes into the Comey. The argument there was 
strictly whether the fact that this company, which did in fact have uh, a registered office in, I think, Dublin, and staff in Dublin, was in fact a Dublin company in circumstances where it, where it was a subsidiary of a 100% uh, Italian owned or Italian uh, shareholder. <coughs> so if I can invite the courts to read paragraphs 32 to 37. So the points we would make in relation to that learning are really as follows. The third party point, ascertainability, wasn't a particularly live point as I understand Eurofood. I'm happy to be corrected. But because it was on a referral to the court, the facts are in fact stated in the, or, or referred to in the Advocate General's. Uh, and there doesn't seem to have been a big bust up tussle about the uh, facts. Uh, so there's not there, there's not a great deal of scrutiny in this case about third parties and who they are and what they might or might not find and whether it's purely hypothetical or whatever else. <coughs> And then we suggest that from paragraph 35, and again 37 really, that the presumption isn't a particularly strong one. I don't think these are probably exhaustive examples, but the um, example certainly that the court fixed on there was the example of a letterbox company. But again, the presumption and the strength of the presumption wasn't really an issue in um, Eurofood. Can you, <clears throat> can you help me with what you say the court meant when in paragraph 37 in the middle, um, just above E, it talks about, um, after saying that the presumption can be rebutted only if factors which are both objective and ascertainable by third <coughs> parties, enable it to be established that an actual situation exists which is different from that which locating it at that registered office is deemed to reflect. What does it act, what, can you just unpack that for me? What does that mean? What does it mean? Yes. Well, it, it, it seems to me that if, you could, if the creditors <coughs> can demonstrate, paint a picture, or show whatever, that there is an actual situation which <coughs> suggests, demonstrates that the Comey is not where the registered office is. That takes you back to paragraph 32, doesn't it? The actual situation yes. should correspond to the place where the debtor conducts the administration of his interests on a regular basis 
and, it, and is therefore ascertainable by both other parties. So it's, that's the situation. Well, that's a direct lift. No, but that, that, that's a direct lift from the old regulation. Yeah, but that's the situation to which the court is referring. Yes. Is it not? Yeah. It's saying, this is what you're looking for. Yeah. You've got a deeming provision, which says it's that is where the registered office is. But if you find that the actual situation, which is different from what the registered office is deemed to reflect, then you go for the actual situation. Yes. That's what that's what it's yeah. saying. Yeah. And and it's talking about the administration of the interests on a regular basis. Yes. What does that mean? <coughs> well it I mean that that is a we we'll see that's a sort of the basis of the it could be a basis for saying it's the average hypothetical creditor group of creditors public availability <coughs> it's not an individual one-off I, 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 I don't think it does mean that I don't think it, it, it does mean that it means it's it seems to me proceeding on the basis that either a creditor can show those things that Joe Bloggs is selling cars from a particular place in wherever in London, even though it's a, I don't know, a French company. Um, either the creditor can show that, or the company can show that. That is the ideal. That is a paradigm case. Where ex where company where um, creditor comes along and says, having reflected on these things and looked at my trans dealings with the company and it, the way it did, I understand, I perceive it to deal with its interests. It's doing this in X territory, and the company comes along and says, no. In a paradigm case, it's considerably easier, but that's not our case because the company kept mum. About these things. <coughs> While we're on Euro foods, um, can I just invite you to pick up the Leon Mobili case? Yes, absolutely. Go to paragraph 35. I'm looking now at the AI translation. Yeah. Um, in paragraph 35, where there is a reference to Eurofood, the translation says that the <coughs> presumption may be disregarded if objective factors and so on. May I suggest that that should be rebutted, which is what the court said in Eurofood, rather than disregarded. <coughs> I don't know what the French says. And then it talks about a real situation different from that which the location of that registered office is supposed to, to reflect, whereas the court in Eurofood said deemed, deemed. to reflect. <coughs> well, my lord, uh, I, th I think it's dangerous for me, who could kind of struggle through it and get the gist of it. Right. Um, it, it. It's dangerous for me to get into a semantic argument. About that, but I will be surprised if the same court said something different. When, when, when I mean, it, 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 it can make mistakes, but when it's actually referring back, as it does expressly there, right. to, its, to its own judgment, it probably meant to say yeah, the same thing. in the original yeah. um, what it said, what it said before. But this is all pre two thousand fifteen. Yes, I know. Well, I mean, I appreciate. I'm just commenting on yeah. the translation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm happy to accept that that's probably, that's probably correct. And in a paradigm case, of course, that's right. In a paradigm case, the court will be faced with a weight of evidence on both sides, and not be forced to fish around hmm. in whatever the creditor has provided. And uh, that's, that's the importance of the um, drawing of adverse inference, <coughs> yeah. which is what the um, deputy judge uh, did. So my, lord, my lords, that's, um, 
I think all I really want to take you to in your ocean. And then uh, if I can go to the Court of Appeal decision in um, Stanford, which is at tab six. And look at page 141. And invite the court to read paragraph 56 of the uh, <coughs> Chancellor's judgment. Yes. So um, the second proposition at letter D on page 141. Doesn't actually tell us um, how something is ascertained. But to that, we have to drop down to three, item three, between E and F. Both objective and ascertainable by, so um, <coughs> establish that the fact is relevant to a rebuttal of the presumption must be both objective and ascertainable by third parties. Query whether even at that time the Chancellor was saying to the actual exclusion of the perception of real creditors. I doubt he, I doubt he was. And if he was, whether or not he was right under the 2000 regulation, we would say he would be, he would not be, be saying the same thing um, under the 2015 regulation for the reasons I've given earlier. There is no discussion in the case of what a typical third party doing business with the company actually is. And there's not really much in there, if anything, about what cons constitutes dealing with the company. Now, we suggest that, very much along the lines of Recital 28, that absolute proof that we are not a typical third party dealing with the company. There was every reason for the deputy judge to have accepted that we were a typical third party dealing with the company. The company offered no evidence of what it actually did. And to the extent that had we made inquiries on looking for other possible creditors or persons dealing with the company, then my Lord, Lord Justice Lewison would say I'd have to ignore that in any event. So we 
know that my clients dealt with the <coughs> company. But other than knowing those matters that are dealt with, putting to one side the Revolut account, by um, the deputy judge in his judgment, <coughs> you've got no idea what the company actually did. The <coughs> deputy judge, when sifting through his thin rule, took account of the fact that the Charter Party was headed London, <coughs> that it was governed by English law, and had an LCIA arbitration clause. That's paragraph 40 of his judgment. He also took account of paragraph 41 of his judgment of the fact that the company's solicitor exhibited an agreement between the company, my clients and others, again governed by English law and subject to an LCIA arbitration <coughs> clause. And in paragraphs 42 to 44, he also noted other agreements governed by um, English law. And those are actual things. Those are actual dealings. How can that actually, though, add any real, if any, weight at all? I mean, people in the shipping world use English law governed contracts with English law arbitration provisions all the time. I mean, you know, and, and none of them think that in doing so, that has any relevance at all, surely, to their Comey, because, I mean, English law has, has for generations been good law, good law for shipping. Yeah. Well, uh, but, irrespective of who you are, um, where you're based, uh, because ships tend to move around the place. That's the nature of the beast. Yeah, but they don't tend to move around the UK. <laughs> well, that's, that's, the point, that's exactly the point I'm making to you. You know, yeah. people with ships all over the world will choose to contract under English law and have English law arbitration. Well, it's a reliable yeah. jurisdiction in which, with which to govern their international relations. But it says no. Well, not the company, I, does it? I, I accept that English law is popular for uh, the reasons that we know it's popular. Yeah. Um, but there are other um, legal, there are other jurisdictions, there are other arbitration jurisdictions that are popular. But it says nothing, but none of them say anything about where the Comey of a Ship owning company or a chartering company might be. Well, my lord, if the <coughs> where, rightly or wrongly, somebody relies on the fact that uh, it has entered into um, English law contracts with an LCIA, LCIA arbitration, and that contract is headed, and that charter party rather, is headed London, <coughs> not necessarily. Factor. It, may, it may be thin rule, but it does say something. If you want to say, if, if the company wants to say that this was happenstance or whatever, then it could tell us what it, it could have told us. It could have told the court what it does, where it does it from. I think Could we've it? got the charter party, haven't we? Yes. <coughs> so, see. So yeah. You've got it, but um, you're all maybe a better man than I if you can. Well, my electrical. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Copy I've got anyway. Where is it? Well, uh, um, sorry, tab five, page tab twenty-seven. Five. Tab five. Oh, sorry, supplemental. Oh, supplemental. Sorry. Tab five, it's completely illegible in my eyes. Yeah. Well, so it's illegible. It, it, it does say it's London. It says London. I can see that. London in the top left-hand corner. Above yeah. the word place, that that's it, is it? Well, that, that's not the only factor. It does contain an, L, an LCIA arbitration. Yes, yes, indeed. <coughs> yeah. 
Right. Just can't make. I'm sorry. I'm bound to say I'm afraid I cannot make sense of the. Uh, I'm struggling significantly to make sense of the uh, the document, but I can see the word London. You can see the word London. And I, I think it's common ground. That it, so. Yes, I mean, it, it, this may or may not assist um, my lord and my own friend, but on page 28, the Lordship may discern a letter K, which is, I think, four paragraphs down from the top. Yes. And although that is illegible, um, from looking at the standard form from which this is taken, I understand it to read the place of general average and arbitration proceedings. Mm. It, I'm not sure if it says shall be or is. London according to the English law. I'm grateful to my friend who's in fact reading it from the even smaller version, illegible version <laughs> that we are. Um, <coughs> but if you go on to 29, you've got East West Logistics LLP with a London address and Millars with a BVI address. That was his registered office, but Mr. Doyle, I think, was. There, there, there was an argument about Mr. Doyle because he had um, addresses in London. But he's not, he's not Millars Group, isn't it? Well, he's signing as director. Yeah. Yes. So that's the where address of the. Of the party <coughs> in, the, in the BVI. At the, at, the, at the time, that's what it was. Yeah. So I don't I'm quite understand why London, on, on the top left hand corner of this charter party, is of any great significance. Well, there, there was an issue as to, work, to, to, to where the charter party was actually signed. Signed. Yeah. As to where it was actually signed. And the company's evidence on that was. Um, uh, well, <coughs> let's suppose it was signed in London yeah. by a company. Giving its addresses in the BVI. Well, that would that, that would suggest that it's administer that, that it has come to London to administer its affair, its, its interest. It's, well, it was interest. It would suggest that its director had come to London to yeah. sign it, or yeah. signed it whilst he was on behalf of the company. Mm. Well, Lord, I, I I don't, and I I'm sure I haven't given the impression. I don't suggest that. The deputy judge, well, the, the, the evidence before the deputy judge was great. I don't suggest <coughs> it was particularly weighty. I don't think I could be accused of having said any of those, <laughs> those things. Yeah. I said he had gruel. How many lumps in it? I, uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, I don't suggest those things. But these are all things which um, have, one way or another, formed part of court's determinations of Comey in the decided cases. And one doesn't simply look. It, it, it would be, be wrong simply to look, we say, at the materials that were before the judge alone. Because the correct context is to say, well, OK, the um, petitioner has put before me, Deputy Judge Baster, some material, which he himself says, ain't the best he's ever seen. <laughs> no. Uh, but he also. Um, observes that he was promised something more from the company and that the company didn't come up with that something more. Just, now, just, just so that I understand, because I'm not sure that I do at the moment, do you say that the company's Comey at the date of the charter party and so on and so forth was in the, in England and Wales, in the UK, at that time, it wow. never was in the BVI. So it was and has remained in the UK. Or do you say that it was in the BVI because they gave an address in the BVI for signing the Charter Party, that's where its registered office was, it 
had litigation in the BVI, and it's somehow moved, not to Malta, but to England. Yeah. Well, well, do, well, I mean, we, I'm you, not say sure I you say it's always been, it's always been in, in I'm the not, I, I, I'm not sure I need answer all those questions in order to um, fairly set out our position. What we say is that the company's registered office was undoubtedly until whichever date in uh, mm. late 2015 in the BVI. Yeah. yeah. Um, had the company not, had we not had the shenanigans about all the judgment and we just got a judgment in the BVI, who knows what would have happened? Yeah. Um, and there would have been no great inquiry about it, much in the same way as if somebody presents a petition to Deputy Judge Baster, which says that it's um, a petition against an English company with a registered office in Stratford. Um, the judge is going to think, well, that's fine. Comey, Comey's been um, established. But by the time the Comey issue became live, these various bits and pieces, thin, yeah. these various bits and pieces came to form the basis of a determination because they had to think about where the company's Comey was, that, that its Comey was in fact in England. Yes, but it, it, on his way to arriving at that conclusion, what the deputy judge judge did was, he said, well, I can forget about the BVI because nobody says that's where it's coming from. Yeah. Is. is. Yeah. Not that it wasn't. No. But was he right to do that? Yes, yeah. because the fact that it's Comey once was in the uh, BVI, it doesn't mean that it's Comey's there. No, it I didn't follow. But if, if, if it's Comey was in the BVI, at the date when it entered into the Charter Party, yeah. if, then the Charter Party can't begin to rebut any presumption. Because at the time it was entered into, on this hypothesis, yeah. the company's Comey was in the BVI. Well, no, the company's well, registered office. The company's registered office. Well, that's why I asked you whether you were saying the Comey never was in the BVI, or whether it was, but it moved. Well, uh, it, its registered office was. But whether it's Comey was, we don't know. Right. We don't know, because they're, they're, they're different things. Co um, uh, register office is binary, either is there mm. or it is wherever it is. But Comey is a different and more subtle yeah. consideration. So um, Presumably you say that when you were attempting to wind up the company in the BVI, <coughs> you didn't need to consider Comey because BVI just assumes jurisdiction to wind up the company no. believing, sorry, if, if it is in fact registered in the BVI, yeah. Comey isn't. Comey's not relevant. Comey's not relevant for the winding up of the BVI, so same. you never had to think about yeah. it. Sa sa same here. But, we, but I'm not sure we ever did. Well, so, sorry. Um, <laughs> let's not worry about it. Let's not worry about saying here because I'm not sure that's right. Yeah, um, but um, certainly it wasn't for quite a long time. No, for, certainly, certainly for a long time it was very. <laughs> yeah, um, but the, so you say you registered office BVI, therefore you you assumed you could bring winding up proceedings in the BVI. Yeah. You didn't have to think about Comey yeah. until you discovered that the company had actually yeah. changed its registered office. Yeah. Yes, but typically one doesn't have to consider these things until such times as the, uh, 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 as the issue becomes. Right. Well, the issue is now live. So, was the Comey in the BVI prior to the move of the registered office? There, there, there is no material. There is no material to suggest that the company's Comey, as opposed to its registered office, actually was in the BVI. And that's why, presumably, Mr. Parrish said in his witness statement when he set out what he relied upon to as the grounds for saying that Comey was in England. Yeah. I think what he said is it's difficult to locate the centre of the company's main interests. Yeah. 
because it's a shell company with no known employees, no offices, nominee shareholders and directors, and apparently no trading activity, if the company has a centre of main interests, then the centre is in the UK yeah. because. Yeah. And then he set out four factors. Yeah. Right. Not pretending it was. <laughs> no, okay. Not pretending it was an easy one. It's all hedged around. But anyway, um, so the factors that the deputy judge took into account have all been factors that have gone into the Kobe pot, have been considered as being matters that are reflective of Kobe. And there was nothing to, despite the promises, despite the assertion there will be. No, you've made this point it, several times, Mr. Yeah. Um, so th there can't be any sensible criticism that we were anything other than a typical third party creditor. We were. And the court has to pay special, give special consideration to our perceptions as at the relevant time. Yeah. <laughs> and if the company doesn't disclose any dealings, doesn't tell us anything about itself, then it has to take the cons bear the consequences of that. My Lord, if we can, my Lord, if we can turn to Mr. Justice Miles's judgment, which is core tab 5, page 36 it starts. But if, if we can actually take it up 51, page 51. Except that there are ways in which I can lose this case, even if I win on the law. I can show it, uh, if I satisfy the court that Mr. Justice Miles got it wrong because he didn't have regard to the recital 28 test. I can still do it. I fully accept that. I'm not saying we've got a slam dunk case on the connecting factors. I'm saying that they were sufficient, and the way that they were dealt with uh, by the district, by, by the deputy judge, was um, well within his. Um, Rights and the exercise of his jurisdiction when uh, when when hearing the case, Mr. Justice. So we're looking now at um, paragraph fifty-six, and we say that that demonstrates the an error that runs through the learned judge's judgment, where he says first the principle of legal certainty and foreseeability. Sorry, which paragraph? So fifty-six, page 56. fifty-one. Sorry. Fifty-six, page fifty-one. Yeah. And um, so he's seeking to identify the right approach in principle. And then he refers to the authorities, and he, he has previously set out recital twenty-eight and Eurofood and Stanford mm -hmm. and the other um, uh, cases. He says first, the principle of legal certainty and foreseeability require that the centre of main interest should be capable of ascertainment by reference to publicly available features. You say that's too high a test. We say that that is <coughs> too high a test, and the right uh, they can either be either be public or ascertainable. Ascertainable. We say we we, we say it's a wrong test, hmm. and also, uh, and also when when we speak about when, when I use the expression ascertainable, I'm happy to include an obvious third party hypothetical creditor. But very unhappy to exclude the actual creditors. Yeah. So you, you go on to say that the judge is wrong at the end of that paragraph to say the right perspective is that of typical third parties. Yes. 
at least without including the actual party. Yes. I mean, nowhere does he actually address. He, he, he does address and explain why he thinks that our factors were so thin that no judge in his right mind uh, could have attached any weight to them. Mm. We say those factors are not that bad and that it was open to a very experienced um, deputy judge in the circumstances to place some weight on them. Um, but nowhere does he refer to the Recital 28 test. And what he does do, in fact, is repeatedly refer to this typical third party Creditor. So if you move on to page 53 of that tab, paragraph 68 of <clears throat> 68. Paragraph 68. Yeah. And if I can invite the court to look at the last one, two, three, uh, five lines of that paragraph. Again. But um, I mean, what the deputy judge said is at paragraph 55 of his judgment on page 126. Uh, and I think, are you saying that, that that is the right test, the one the deputy judge applied? Because he refers to a decision of mine which is which is wrong. Yeah. Well, I'll come. I'll, I'll come on to what he did or didn't do with Lennox. Yeah. Uh, and he says the fact that Comey, the fact that Comey was and remains in England, in the UK, was and still is similarly ascertainable, albeit less readily, by one reasonably diligent creditor, and could well, be by others. So, you, if you want to find out, you can. Is what he's saying. Well, let, let's look at what he's. My lord's in paragraph fifty-five. Is that yes. Right? Well, what he says there in the second line, I make the obvious, I make the obvious observation that the petitioning creditor, a third party, has in fact ascertained the company's centre of main interest mm. and done so in the face of a cloud of obscurity. Yeah. So he is there, consciously or otherwise, actually getting it right by reference to... Actually, he's not, because it, I mean, it doesn't actually make... When he's, it's an unfortunate use of the expression ascertained, isn't it, in the third line. What in fact you were doing was saying, if and to the extent there is a centre of main interest, we submit that this is where it is. It's our perceptions. <clears throat> it's what we understand. But, but what the what the jurisprudence, what the authorities actually require is an assessment of factors which are ascertainable by third parties. <clears throat> well, yes, but not to the exclusion. This is a point about Article. Yeah. Oh, sorry, recital. Yeah, yeah. So not the exclusion yeah. of an actual creditor yeah. dealing, yeah. and then we have this debate about dealing. the extent to which it has to be dealing in the ordinary course or otherwise. And we haven't looked at interradial mm -hmm. yet, which puts a different gloss on this as well. Because yeah. what the judge found, or what you found, is what he summarises in paragraph 54, that the company was administering its interest in both the UK and Switzerland, so both were centres of interest, yeah. And then he says, well, which one is the main one? Yeah. By a narrow margin, I choose London. Yeah. And those are available findings to him based on actual mm. dealings. Maybe can you, have, will... can you have more than one centre of main interest? Um, I'm not sure. Because he, he, he suggests in that paragraph 54, as my lord's just pointed out, that he's, he treats the UK and Switzerland so that both were centres of the company's interests. They can't both be. 
Well, well he, yeah. then, he, then he says which one is the main yeah. one. Yeah. I think that's his reasoning. You, 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 you can't have both because you can only have one. Yeah, you can, you can only, only have, have main. And I think, and I think UK is more main than Switzerland. Yeah, by a narrow margin. Yeah, and not without. I can't remember what he said. Circumspection or not, not without Quite. certainty. Yes, give me. So that hardly promotes legal certainty. Hmm? That hardly promotes legal certainty. It's a difficult case. I concede that. It's an odd case. It's a, it's a case where the evidence was thin. Mm. I don't. Mm. I think it, it, it might be said against you. Well, if you're if you're in that position, um, that you know you've got centres of interest in more than one place, yeah. more than one jurisdiction, then you've really got no option but to fall back on the default provision, which is that um, this where the registered office is. Well, um, because you can't expect creditors. I mean, some other creditors might have thought, oh, well, Switzerland. More main. Than well, other, other, other creditors could have come in and joined and said, no, it, it should be Switzerland, <laughs> Viva, or whatever else. Um, the, that, that's a nice, um, a nice point, if I could put it this way, from a judge in the Court of Appeal in uh, London. The reality of the case is that wherever, wherever we would have issued proceedings, even if they were in the place of the registered office, we would be faced with countervailing. No doubt. Uh, cultivating arguments, because this was a case of a shift in registered office to, for precisely that purpose, to make our life hmm. uh, more difficult. Yeah. But um, in paragraph 55 of the um, deputy judge's judgment, he does expressly consider our stuff, <coughs> our, our, sorry, our, stuff our, uh, our perceptions and the materials that we've produced. Yes. And the cloud of obscurity isn't saying, as it seems to me, as a result of inquiries, private detectives, that kind of um, approach. It's the cloud of obscurity is the company keeping stumm about mm. where it's actual um, about what it was even, let alone where it didn't. <coughs> But going back to Mr. Justice Marr's judgment in um, tab five of the bundle, yeah, um, paragraph sixty-eight, we say also the last five lines. Mm -hmm. If we look at that, sorry, um, then paragraph sixty-nine. Similar approach in the last three lines. Yeah. And then 70, there's just a mention of this. But um, it shows us uh, Mr. Justice Miles's mindset. 87, paragraph 87. I mean, that must be wrong as a matter of principle. Whether or not... Sorry, 87. 80, 87, page 56. Maybe. Whether or not my Lord, uh, Lord Justice Snowden is right about um, shipping contracts containing London arbitration clauses and English law. And I dare say there's, there may be some truth in what, what, what he says. Nonetheless, the approach in paragraph 87, we say, is demonstrably... Well, this is quite, I mean, this is quite um, an important point, which was touched on, we haven't been to Interedil, but was touched on in Interedil, um, which I hope you're going to get to at some point, but um, very often the company has significant contracts with a wide range of people. Yeah. And in, in Interedil, one of the points that the ECJ said could be take, could have been taken into account legitimately by the Italian court in that case was that the company in question had banking contracts with a particular financial institution. Yeah. Now, the ECJ said that that was likely to be a matter in the public domain. Yeah. Not quite sure why. 
necessarily. But you know, possibly because of the finding of the, the, the council. I don't know. But I mean, what, it, what the judge is referring to, I think, <coughs> is what the deputy judge had said in paragraphs forty-three and forty-four when he's looking at contracts, not with your client, but with other people who contracted with the company. And so what he's saying is, well, why should creditor A be expected to know anything about the contract between the company and creditor B? That, that's all he's saying. Well, the Lord, he should be expected in this context that these were materials that were put forward by the company itself. Yes. To show well, its case. After the dispute had arisen, yes. <coughs> and so, th and there's nothing to assume, there's no reason to assume that those were not evidence of typical third party contracts. <coughs> so he can have regard to them. Right. It's not investigation by us, that's the company's own, own materials. So in paragraph 87, we say um, that demonstrates that, sorry, going back to tab five. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Justice Miles' judgment. 87, we say, demonstrates the, with respect, error in his approach. And paragraph 89, likewise. And to <coughs> yeah. round it all off, paragraph 95. I mean, do you see at a high level where the judge went wrong was to posit a distinction between typical creditors on the one hand, who are kind of hypothetical entities yeah. divorced from the real world, yeah. and the actual real world creditor who is your client. Yes. Well, regulation, um, sorry. And by virtue of concentrating only on the hypothetical class, he overlooked the, so to speak, what was staring him in the face, which was the actual experience of your very own. Well, he said, yes, that, that's an error. And he certainly should have weighed it up. Not in the context, and it was open to him to say, I wouldn't have reached this conclusion. Unless he thought it was completely potty and, uh, uh, and, and therefore said, and, uh, and what's more, no judge could possibly have reached this conclusion. Mm. You can't ignore it. And that test, that, that, that approach must must be wrong, because... Well, except you say that, but the test is framed in terms of it being typical creditors who you were looking at. And well, on the face of it, that is inviting a, a sort of hypothetical no, the, 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 isn't it? No, the, 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 the test, going back to the recitals, mm. does include creditors. That's paragraph... Hence your emphasis on recital 28. Well, yeah, I mean, but, I understand why you rely on it. It's there. I mean, it's there. It's, it's what it says. It, it, and and, and, and you know, I, I can trump my Lord's on, uh, recital 30 by saying, well, it just says, do whatever you do in recital 30. But my recital 28 <coughs> specifically enjoins the court, whatever it means, pay special consideration. To my clients' perceptions, yeah, yeah, and it's a very dangerous approach, and it would be a very odd approach to simply rely on some form of hypothetical creditor. It would be impossible on the facts of our case, because as the deputy judge complained, uh, the company, despite having said it would come forward with material, didn't. So how can a judge in any event hypothesize about what a typical creditor of a company that does, I know, yeah. that does what? Mm. I mean, it, it, I think really what it really comes to is this. You, you say, well, I'm a typical creditor, yeah. and this is what I found. Well, tell me why I'm not. So I, I, yeah. I don't mean to do that. Tell me that I'm not. Yeah. 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 And this is what I found. Mm. And the, oh, uh, well, not, not found. This is what I perceived. Mm. Yeah. This yeah. is what I perceived in ordinary dealings. Yeah. Now then, if you don't like that, if you, company, don't like that, if you don't think I'm a typical creditor, or you don't think these are ordinary course of business dealings, 
Come along and tell the court or tell mm. me yeah. why. And, that, and that's, is it a recital 31 or 32, mm. where it says the, the, the yeah. judge can tell the credit, the uh, company to put in evidence and give the creditor an opportunity to answer. Tell me, t tell the creditors why they're wrong and give them an opportunity to answer. Yeah. And th that is the uh, error of the approach. And of course, in lots of cases, unless the court's got something to go on, <coughs> how can the court even fathom what this typical creditor yeah. is if it doesn't actually know what the company does? I would one way of, perhaps another way of putting this point would be to say that once you've established in a situation of Quite worth dealing with, that you are a creditor, and yeah. on any view, your client has done that much, then that places an evidential burden on the company, if it wishes to say, well, nevertheless, you're not a typical creditor. Yeah. And that's not going to get off the ground if the company has been given the opportunity to produce evidence but has failed to do so. So, yeah. in that situation, you're entitled, as the judge did, sorry, as the deputy judge did, to make ad to draw an adverse inference and say, well, I'm going to proceed on the footing that your client is a typical creditor, precisely because it is a creditor, yeah. and no countervailing evidence has been produced. It, yes, but it's slightly worse than that because not only was the company given, opportun given an opportunity, it said we are do we, we we are doing this. Well, yes, <coughs> um, and so the 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 error it, 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 it seems to us that it's it's simply dangerous for a court to arrogate to itself a determination in vacuo of what a typical creditor of any company is without a lot more, certainly without, not know, without knowing what the um, company actually gets up to, where and how and through what means, none of which was available here. Thank <coughs> At the risk of just doing it before one o'clock, can I just, just go back to the point I was going to make, that there is a problem in a many of these Comey cases that a company deals with one particular group of creditors in a particular way, which yeah. may not be, as it were, the way it deals with a different group of creditors, yeah. and the two may not know how the other is dealt with on a specific basis. Yeah. I think your criticism of the judge is that the judge's approach would effectively rule out the actual evidence as to how the company has dealt with both groups of creditors because neither is a typical one which yeah. would know what the other was doing. Yeah. Make it specific. Financial institutions routinely ask for a covenant in their financial instruments by the company stating, this is my Comey for the purpose of the European Insolvency Regulation yeah. and I won't change it without telling you. Yeah. Financial institutions get that covenant. They know where they are told, perceive that the company's Comey is. A trade creditor won't know of that provision in the banking instruments. But if the banking instruments want to bring proceedings to put the company into administration or wind it up, why shouldn't they be able to rely upon the express warranty that the company has given them as to where its Comey well, is? Uh, I, I'm not uh, saying. Is, I mean, is that that's the sort of issue that actually arises in real life? No, no. I, 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 I'm aware of those uh, covenants of that nature, but I, th I, I think one has to step back and say, what is the exercise that the court is performing when it is opening insolvency proceedings? Yeah. Now, the company can has, I submit, and I think I'm probably right at least on that, uh, can only have one company. I, I, I'm trying to make a point in your favour, just in case you yeah. miss no, no. that. Okay. Yeah. As I understand it, the point that you are making is that the judges of Justice Miles' approach have yeah. taken strictly would ignore that covenant in, in, in searching for the typical hypothetical yeah. third party creditor yeah. would ignore that covenant yeah. and make it make it not a relevant factor yeah. because the trade creditors wouldn't necessarily know about it. Yeah. And you say that can't be right. That, we, we, we say that we, we, we say that can't be right at all. And if there was a tussle about it between group so when A... When I say making a point in your favour, I'm just saying making a point, this is a yeah, yeah, no, point no, you're no, trying no, to yeah, make. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, if there was, and if there was a tussle about it um, between different groups of creditors, A, the court would presumably be informed of everybody else's perceptions, i.e. group A and group B creditors and whoever else, 
and the companies, and and they would explain that co that 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 that, well, that covenant. At but, some point, you'll need to. I would like you to. Certainly, I would like you to look at paragraph fifty-three of Interedil, yeah. and <coughs> address address that well, type well, of situation by reference to paragraph fifty-three. Well, 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 well I'll have you do that. Would it be convenient? Uh, how much longer are you, are you going to need, Mr. Lee? Well, Lord, I will go back and I will cut my cloth. I will try and be. I, I did speak to my, my learned friend, Mr. Sheehan, um, yesterday. Have you agreed a timetable? My Lord, we, we agreed that we would split the time equally, yeah. uh, which causes a problem, I think, given that we've been out of the It is going to be through. a problem. Well, how much time do you think you're going to need? Um, my Lord, I'm, I'm going to do the same thing and uh, spend the time over the short adjournment trying to focus my discussions on what my learned friend has said this morning. There are some things I can probably make economies on. Uh, but, but I was working on the basis that I would have half, half of the time, so uh, I'll do what I can. But I, I do make that point to my learned friend. Well, Mr. Levy, um, I think I must ask you to make your submissions after the adjournment as short as you can. But Lord, I, um, I will not permit you to go beyond half past two. But Lord, I, um, I would encourage you to finish well before absolutely. then. Absolutely, but Lord, I will do so. My learned friend is quite right. Uh, though we did say yesterday when we, we discussed matters, I had to take the court through the. Uh, through the uh, uh, regulations yeah. and to the principal cases, but uh, I'm conscious of, the, of that, and I don't want to eat up yeah. too much time. All right, two of them. Very obliged. Court rise. No, I wasn't suggesting you should no, somehow no. stop now. No, I'm no, just no, thinking no. that bearing in mind what you 